Hi, everyone, and welcome to Reply's webinar on the intersection of circular economy and carbon emissions. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Valentina Rappa, and I'm joined here today by my colleague, Daniel Keitzer. We are going to start the session with just a few um, information on ground rules. So everyone that's joining this webinar is muted, and we just ask that you stay muted throughout the entire hour. If you have any questions throughout the session, then you're welcome to put them in the chat and uh, we can address those at a midway point of the webinar as well as at the end of the webinar. And then in certain slides throughout the webinar, there will be opportunities for us to take a pulse on the audience through several polls. So I just want to give you a heads up if you can open a tab on your computer or have your cell phone available next to you, because we'll give you a link to access the poll and participate in it. So with that, I think we can get started and go into some quick introductions. Daniel, do you wanna kick it off? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks everyone for, for joining us today. Thank you, Valentina, for that great intro. Uh, I'm Daniel Keitzer. Uh, I lead our ecosystem growth team here at Reaply. Um, we're, we're all circular economy community builders here uh, at the company. Uh, my role specifically focuses on uh, how to shape and build that community in a way that prioritizes highest and best use of resources that are on Reply's platform. Uh, I have a background in the sustainability world uh, with a lot of nonprofit work, a little bit of for-profit work, uh, helping to design sustainability projects across a, a pretty wide range of, uh, of spectrums and subjects. But circular economy is the subject that, that really stuck for me uh, and, and what I'm super passionate about working on today. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and I'm Valentina. I am a circular economy strategist here at Reaply. I lead our sustainability consulting services, which is really working with our customers to develop long-term reuse strategies that allow them to advance their sustainability goals while, of course, integrating the Reaply platform into everything they do at their company with regard to reuse. And my background is educationally in environmental engineering. I have some industry experience across the plastics industry, as well as work with sustainability reporting and strategy. Now, just to give a breakdown of our plan for this webinar, Daniel will kick us off with just a quick introduction on Reaply, who we are, what we do. And then we'll go into some foundational terminology to make sure that everyone is coming in with the same basics and we understand some of the key terms with regards to carbon and circularity. We'll take a pause at that point to answer any questions midway through the webinar. And then we will go into uh, discussing the, inter the relationship between circular economy and carbon emissions and uh, wrap it up with a few resources that you're welcome to look at after the webinar for further reading. And then we'll again revisit any remaining questions that we didn't get to in the midway point of this session. So with that, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah. Thank you. You can jump to the next slide too. Perfect. Um, so uh, Reboot was founded in 2016 with uh, an idea spark that uh, we can and should connect excess resources to those in need. Um, so, so very, very basic. And that uh, that that tiny idea that that got us started has now uh, evolved us into uh, what the company is today, where uh, we're all uh, very much on a mission to uh, build a community where every workplace resource finds its next use. Um, and, and and we're we're pursuing that through a number of very cool partnerships, a number of very cool cost, customer relationships, uh, and and really growing this into uh, what um, I, I think probably is and and most certainly will be uh, the the largest kind of reuse community of its kind, uh, working to advance the circular economy. Amazing. Okay, so with that. We'll jump into some foundational terminology, kicking it off with probably the most basic term for the work that we do, which is the circular economy. Now, this is probably the most important term for Reaply. It is everything that our company works towards and is trying to contribute to. And this is an economic system that's aimed at eliminating waste and promoting a continual use of resources. With respect to various companies across all industries, 
there is a lot of interest in implementing circular practices for opportunities with regard to getting ahead of policy compliance, opportunities to mitigate supply chain risks, as well as finding creative and innovative ways to generate new revenue and reduce costs. When we think of Reaply, as I mentioned, this, this is so core to who we are as a company and everything that we do is with the intent of further developing the circular economy and making a circular economy more accessible. And so when we think of the Reaply platform, their, the main purpose is really looking at how to continue recirculating items and materials and facilitating reuse so that our customers can, as a result, reduce their waste and reduce any excess procurement that they're currently running in their processes. So this is very home to, to Reaply and will be a very critical term for the remainder of the session. With that, we're going to go into our first poll, which is asking a question regarding your familiarity with scope one, two, and three greenhouse gas emissions. So if you can just take a moment to open that other browser on your computer or go on your cell phone, go to menti.com and put in the code that you're seeing at the top of this screen. And as the audience starts to add their thoughts here, we should see the results pop up on the screen. And just to note, the, the reason for this question is more to give us an understanding of where the audience is at with this, uh, this information so we can tweak uh, how we communicate these topics. Okay. <coughs> so nice. definitely. A lot of familiarity. Yeah. And it seems like, yeah, we have representation on both sides of the spectrum. So we'll definitely account for that whenever we talk about these, these different terms in the following few slides. Okay. We'll give it a few more seconds for anyone else that wants to jump on mentee. And just a heads up, there will be one more poll like this later on in the webinar. So you're welcome to, to keep mentee open and, and put in that next code. But I think we probably have most of the results in. So with that, we'll move forward. It seems like majority of the audience is very familiar with the difference of scope one, two, and three. And that's amazing to hear. So hopefully when we talk more about the connection of carbon emissions and um, these different greenhouse gas scope emissions, that will be really helpful. So moving on, let's jump into the first term. So scope one emissions. This is looking at direct emissions from owned or controlled sources. So if you think of a company that is a power company, they operate a power plant and that power plant uh, generates uh, carbon emissions that, that are released into the atmosphere. The, emiss the emissions associated with that power plant are scope one emissions for that power company. So want to just take a moment and, and share that when we think of scope one, two, and three, it's with respect to the company that is reporting their emissions. And if you have direct emissions from anything you own and control, that is your scope one emissions. This is very relevant, as mentioned, to any companies within the power sector. And uh, for them, it's a, maybe a much larger scope of their emissions than scope two and three. But for a lot of other companies in various other sectors, scope one emissions can be significantly smaller than scope two and three. And in addition to that, just from all of the work that's been done, scope one emissions, it's pretty easy to measure at this point. There are a lot of clear strategies and approaches to measuring and reporting scope one emissions. When we think about how this connects to Reaply and how it connects to the reuse sector, scope one emissions is really not where we have a direct uh, relationship and connection to, to carbon emissions in general. So when we think of reuse, we're looking at reusing goods and services. These are often purchased goods. And with that respect, it's not something that a company owns and operates and therefore wouldn't be accounted for within their scope one emissions. But Daniel will share more on scope two and three and really get to where that connection lies. Awesome. So yeah, so jumping in the scope two emissions. So when we when we talk about scope two, we're talking about emissions associated with the generation of energy 
that a company purchases. Um, most typically, that's in the form of electricity. Uh, and so, if you're if you're wanting to get an impression of your scope two emissions and wanting to do accounting around that, you can look at the amount of power that uh, your company is utilizing. So, you know, look at the uh, at your uh, energy meter on the side of the building. Uh, combine that with the emissions rate of the company that's purchasing your power, um, and then uh, use those two inputs to get a, a basic handle on your scope two emissions. So, uh, so relatively simple to to kind of think about and conceptualize. Um, scope two emissions can be uh, a really powerful mechanism to help drive change in some of our higher emitting sectors, like the power sector, as an example. So, if you're if you're a company that's purchasing a lot of electricity, uh, you can use that purchasing power to then go upstream to your power producer and say, "Hey, we're trying to get our scope twos under control. We really need to partner with you on renewable energy projects, on other ways that." Uh, we can clean up your generation portfolio so we can clean up our scope twos. Um, and that's a really, really nice mechanism as we've seen uh, here in the US in particular uh, in the absence of any kind of clear and consistent uh, federal policy around uh, clean up our, our, our power portfolios. So um, just like scope ones, scope twos don't necessarily connect to, to replay and reuse. Obviously super, super important in the grand scheme of things of, of, of reducing global emissions, but uh, not something that we're directly influencing necessarily through circular economy activities. Where we do get into this connection though, is when we talk about scope three. So uh, scope three, you can think of kind of as the, the everything else scope in a lot of ways. Um, and so this is including uh, the entire value chain of, of, of a company to, to produce products or to, uh, or to do their business, both upstream, uh, in, you know, looking at the types of materials that are being brought into a manufacturing process, for example, uh, and then also downstream, uh, looking at how those products or goods or services are being utilized in the marketplace. Um, scope three includes uh, a, a pretty broad range of categories, 15 in total, uh, that are looking at both of those sides, the upstream and downstream, uh, and can kind of help companies organize, organize and conceptualize uh, where those different scope three uh, emissions lie. Um, big ones for that and important ones for our conversation are around purchase goods and services, capital goods, uh, transportation and distribution, uh, and then also some of the uh, uh, end use uh, scenarios and categories uh, for products as well. Um, scope three emissions are super, super relevant to uh, almost every company um, and for uh, certain industries and certain sectors, they can be a comparatively massive slice of pie compared to the scope ones and scope twos. Uh, in the example that's on screen, if you think about a company like McDonald's, uh, where you have a whole lot of very intensive inputs going into producing a cheeseburger, producing their products, um, and, and you're tallying up all of those emissions, that's a, that's a pretty significant uh, uh, piece of, uh, of that total profile. Um, scope three emissions is where everything connects back to reuse and circular economy. Um, and, and when we talk about that in the context of the work that we're doing, um, we're typically looking at uh, the impact that reuse has on purchasing less goods over time, on extending the, the use and life cycle of an asset, uh, and then avoiding CO2 uh, associated with the disposal of, uh, of assets and materials. Great, thanks Daniel. So with that, we wanted to show a quick example of a company's scope three emissions. So this is looking at Microsoft's scope three emissions from their 2021 sustainability report. And just to Daniel's point, mentioning that a lot of companies for scope three emissions, it ends up accounting for a majority of their emissions compared to scope one and two. And this is a great example. When you look at Microsoft scope three emissions, that's almost 98% of their total greenhouse gas emissions is coming from scope three. And the main categories that are contributing to that 98% are category one, purchase goods and services, 
category two, capital goods, and nine, the use of their sold products. So we'll get into more details specifically on each of these categories, what they mean, and the direct relationship with reuse. But just for the moment here to share the example with purchase goods and services, this is looking at any goods that a company is purchasing to run their business. This is accounting for any goods they purchase to manufacture the products that they sell, as well as any purchased goods that are associated with just running their operations that could be within their offices and their facilities. So not necessarily related to the products they produce. Um, so as mentioned, we'll go into more details here, but we just wanted to, to share an example of why it's so important to to look deep into scope three emissions and show the complexities of accounting for scope three emissions because it's covering all of these, these 15 categories, which is very extensive. So with that, just wanted to wrap up this session on, on scope one, two, and three by sharing a visual graphic. This was adopted by the greenhouse grass protocol. And what we're seeing here is again, scope one, two, and three emissions with the reporting company in the center of the graphic. We can see on the left-hand side, the upstream activities that feed into the reporting company, both scope two and scope three, as well as the downstream activities that are leaving the reporting company, which are scope three emissions. Um, and just to give a quick highlight to one of the examples for a downstream activity, one of them is the end of life treatment of sold products. So when you think of, a, for example, a company that say they produce plastic bottles and they sell that to consumers, and those bottles are then used. And when they reach their end of life, best case scenario, they go to a recycling facility and there is a market for that recycled plastic. In many cases, there might not be recycling infrastructure to handle that plastic bottle. It might just end up in the environment. And so in scenarios like that, we have to think of the emissions associated with the end of life of that plastic bottle. So that's just an example of, of a downstream activity. Um, but this is a great graphic to return to if you want to conceptualize the difference between scope one, two, and three. And with that, I'll pass it back to Daniel to talk about a really important uh, uh, term with regard to reuse. Awesome. Yeah. So when we uh, so when we think about the action of reuse, so taking utilizing a product that's already been manufactured, that's already uh, in your space or you know, available or accessible to you in some form or fashion. Um, by reusing that, what we hope is that you're not going out and buying the same product. Uh, and then in the process of that, displacing the purchase of that new product and all of the associated emissions that would go into making that new product. And so that's really the concept that uh, we're talking about when we look at this term displacement. So the displacement of a new purchase and thus hopefully the production of a new product. Um, and, and so displacement is really important for us when we think about the action of reuse, when we think about our kind of broader impact through circular economy, um, because we're trying to reduce the impact associated with making all of this new stuff uh, and then through uh, some methodologies for measuring that, be able to report out on the amount of carbon not brought into a certain measurement boundary uh, because of this action of displacement. Uh, now, on in, in theory, it sounds great. In practice, it's a little the displacement's kind of a tricky one, um, you know, because it we're talking about measuring uh, user behavior number one. So. Uh, and, and consumer behavior. So, you know, to be able to say with 100% confidence that my action of reuse truly, absolutely didn't result in me ever purchasing that product again, uh, or or that product for that particular need at that particular time, uh, is is, is kind of tricky to measure, um, and and kind of tricky to, uh, to 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 kind of think through for for folks. So that's. That's one obstacle, I think, in the way of uh, of measuring displacement and displacement rate. Uh, and then the other being uh, truly knowing that that action of of reuse and that displacement uh, that displacement act uh, truly didn't result in the production of a new product. Um, and and that's uh, maybe not typically the case, but. Again, hopefully over time, hopefully as more and more of these 
uh, reuse activities start to take place. That's the general trend and the general direction that that things will be going in. Um, and and so you know I, I've said this uh, before, but uh, this whole idea of displacement is super super crucial to uh, everything that we're doing to build reuse, to drive reuse, uh, and and to make more reuse happen in the in the market. Uh, another uh, term that you'll hear uh, quite a bit in this space is embodied carbon uh, and and how that contrasts to operational carbon. Um, and so what uh, what we're saying when, when we try to define embodied carbon um, is really looking at uh, all of the associated emissions that go into producing a product. Um, and and labeling those emissions as embodied carbon. Uh, this is a term that's often utilized in the built environment space. I know this isn't a built environment specific presentation, so we're mixing uh, a few different ones, but you'll hear uh, embodied carbon a lot in the context of, of built environment reuse and in the context of buildings, uh, where it's super, super, super important to reduce the amount of embodied carbon going into uh, a building project um, because that's you, you can kind of think of that as your your baseline almost uh, carbon that is being released into the atmosphere that you'll never get back that you'll never be able to uh, no, no matter what you do to improve performance you'll never uh, reduce that initial embodied carbon hit for a project um, where in contrast to operational carbon which uh, is you know, increasing over time, over the life cycle of, of a building in this example. Uh, you can deploy a whole bunch of different strategies to reduce operational carbon over time. So energy efficiency projects, other kind of high performance building uh, upgrades and improvements uh, or designs. Um, so, so embodied carbon for us uh, we, is really kind of the the next frontier, I would say, for the industry as a whole, the built environment industry as a whole, it's kind of the next frontier um, where a whole lot of companies are really focused on reducing the amount of embodied carbon in new products. Uh, and then also a whole bunch of companies, including Reapley, uh, are looking at how reuse can help with embodied carbon as well, um, because reusing an existing product, reusing an existing material uh, is, is really the best strategy to, to cut that embodied carbon number. Um, and, and so when, when we're uh, kind of talking to the market and we're bringing solutions to the market uh, and we're talking to folks about strategies to reduce embodied carbon, uh, reuse is really the, the, the way that we like to, to lead into those conversations. Great. Yeah, and this is just a quick visual to show what embodied carbon and operational carbon looks like within the respect of a life cycle of a building and how does that how does carbon transition from embodied to operational to end of life so for example when we're looking at this figure here we have raw materials transport manufacturing all of that is feeding into the embodied carbon of a building then the building is constructed and it goes through use and once it's in use and maintenance and repairs come up throughout the lifetime of that building that is what's accounted for under the operational carbon. And then as well as it goes more towards the end of its lifetime, then it transitions to another stage. But this is a really helpful and clear figure adopted from Perkins and Will that looks at that transition over time. And as Daniel mentioned, when we're trying to think of how do we reduce embodied carbon emissions, we already mentioned some of the impact that you can have with respect to reuse. In addition, when you're trying to source the materials that you'll use for the building itself and the structure, it's really critical to look at potential opportunities for new materials that could be alternatives to some of the current standard existing materials. So if we're thinking of concrete, steel, and aluminum, these account for a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions, especially when in the building space. So if there's opportunities to find alternatives from some of these when you're building a structure, then um, at the start, at that upfront opportunity is where you should really account for it and therefore have a reduction in the embodied carbon of that building. And with that, I think we'll pause for questions. We have our colleague, Bonnie, Barney Sankar on the line, who has been fielding any questions that may have come through from the audience 
we'll take a pause and and talk through some of those. Yeah, we have one question about displacement. So I think Daniel, this is going to go to you. Uh, does displacement happen once or does it happen multiple times across a product's lifetime? Um, I would say it could happen multiple times. So, so if we think of displacement as uh, a behavior, right? Um, if you're, if I'm reusing this pencil, the first time I reuse this pencil, if I don't go out and buy a new pencil, which is great. Valentina gets this pencil from me at some point in the future, and that action of reuse, Valentina didn't go out and buy a new pencil. So we're talking about two instances of displacement throughout the reuse life cycle of this pencil. Um, so it could happen multiple times. It could happen once, just depending on the scenario. Yeah, that's great. And then I think, Valentina, this might go to you, but what is the difference between upstream and downstream with scope three, I think there's some yes. clarity that that people are looking for. Yeah, and I'm just gonna backtrack real quick to the slide that shows the the visual of scope one, two, and three emissions. So when we're thinking of upstream feeding into the reporting company, you can think of any emissions associated with the the products that a company and the services that a company provides to the market. So anything when it comes to sourcing those materials, when it comes to transportation, getting it to the reporting company, those are upstream from the company. Once the company then manufactures that product and then sells it out to the market, those are downstream activities that are as effective or impacted by the product that they actually or the service that they deliver. So I think that's a great question. I feel like it can be confusing at times, but um, I hope that clears up any confusion. Do you have anything to add there, Daniel? Yeah, no, I think you you summed it up well. Um, if we if we go back to our McDonald's example, um, you know, so upstream emission activities, so all of the emissions associated with uh, producing hamburger meat, so cows and methane and 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 everything that goes into that process, um, that hamburger then is produced, um, but maybe it's only half eaten. At the end of the life of its of its life, um, of what what's remaining of that hamburger, uh, it's thrown in the trash and not in the compost. So it continues to release methane uh, at its point of disposal. So that would be uh, that would be an, an associated downstream activity that that we would then put into those categories. I like returning to the McDonald's example. Yeah. I like hamburgers. <laughs> Should we do one more maybe? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of questions that I'm seeing that are just coming in around actions organizations can take and then the verification process, especially around scope three, given that the focus has been shifting from one and two to scope three. So I'm, I'm generalizing a few questions that I've gotten in the chat, but how um, do, in maybe your opinion or maybe what we're doing here, how are organizations taking actions to reduce scope three emissions, but also what does a ver verification process look like in that sense? Yeah, I can start. Um, I would say even before taking actions to reduce scope three emissions, I think a lot of companies are still working to like get their scope three emissions on handle and understand all of their scope three emissions. I think for, for some companies that are really far ahead in this, they've looked at all 15 categories. They've been able to identify of those 15, where is their industry most impacted or has any results in emissions? And they've been able to report on those. But in many cases, a lot of companies are first off trying to understand of the 15 that relate to them and their business, how do they accurately gather and collect that data and then report it out in a standardized way? So I think in many cases, companies are not really reporting all of their scope three emissions to the full extent of it because they're still trying to actually quantify that themselves and account for that themselves. Um, when it comes to just a reduction efforts, I would say that a lot of companies that produce physical products, they there's a huge impact when it looks like looking at like their downstream emissions and you're thinking of the use of their sold products. And then as we mentioned, end of life treatment of their sold products finding opportunities to bring, take back those materials into their 
their manufacturing processes and build it into new products that they produce. Uh, I've seen as an area where a lot of companies are trying to test out and understand what are the capabilities around that? How does that affect the, the quality of their new product? Um, but uh, there's a variety of other ways. I think ma mainly, as we mentioned before, with the, with the pandemic also resulting in like reduced travel, I've seen a lot of companies just taking advantage of reduced travel emissions from their employees resulting in, in lower emissions. But that of course is potentially won't be for, for a long period of time. Um, yeah, I'll pause and add any other. Yeah, thoughts. no, that was great. Um, yeah, I mean, shout out to the Microsoft sustainability yeah. team. If anyone from over there is listening, uh, you know, that, that slide that we showed that has that amazing breakdown of all the different categories, like that's, that that's very rare. Um, yeah, that, and, and I think that's like a shining example of, uh, of a company that's just done an amazing job on, uh, on accounting for, uh, emissions across all of those different categories. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's super, super important to, to develop that understanding, but, you know, it doesn't, it, you don't absolutely have to have that granular of a, of an understanding of, of your emissions profile to, to get started. And I think that's also, uh, something really important to emphasize. So, um, you know, I think in terms of strategy, you know, a lot of, a lot of companies and a lot of leaders in this space would say, you know, try to try to get a handle on what some of those biggest buckets are. Um, you know, if you're, uh, and, and then, and then, you know, use that to, to, to set your priorities on, on what to tackle first. Um, and there's a few different industry examples and a few different business examples of, uh, of how that's been done in practice. So, uh, you know, I would say start with high impacts, but uh, also don't uh, necessarily neglect to just start with what's easy. Um, and I think that's what uh, really excites us about uh, this whole reuse space is that like it's it's a really easy way to get started uh, and 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 it shows impact and there is measurable impact associated with it. So, um, so I think that's another side of it when we're thinking about uh, strategies is just like find what's impactful 100% absolutely, but also think about what's easy to implement and just get started. I think we're good. Okay, cool. All right, so we'll go back to the remaining content. Keep on putting your questions in chat and we'll, we'll look at those at the end of this session. But now we're going to move on and connect all those terms that we just shared with circularity and reuse to carbon. We already mentioned where the connection is with scope three emissions, but now we're going to talk just at a larger picture at first, where circularity could reduce global emissions. So what we're seeing here on this slide, the figure on the right was adopted from um, Circle Economy, and it's from their Circularity Gap Report. And what it's showing here is on your path to trying to get to 1.5 degrees Celsius, there is various opportunities for society to partake in circular activities that would, as a result, reduce the carbon emissions that are emitted into the atmosphere, or more generally greenhouse gas emissions emitted into the atmosphere, um, and make it make a greater impact. But I think the most important thing to, to speak to here is that when we're looking at figures like this, this is showing a, a projection um, based off of models of what we estimate the reduction in emissions could be if you were to partake in these different activities. And, you know, you can look at this figure deeply, but this is going into activities such as the usage of your vehicles, improving the utilization of your vehicle, looking for ways to have more efficiency in your home when, with regard to heating and cooling, various different activities that we're as individuals are very familiar with, but then at a large scale globally can, can affect emissions. So when we think of the three areas where circularity can tap into the reduction of emissions. The first is material usage. The second is new business models. And the third is regeneration of nature. 
And when we start with material usage, this is essentially looking at the extraction of raw materials that are used for manufacturing that often result then in waste. If we're keeping a good in circulation or a physical good in circulation for a longer period of time, extending its lifetime, we would see a result in reducing that material extraction and, and waste associated with that. In addition, opportunities to take what may be currently assumed as a waste product and feed it back into the, reintegrate it back into the production of a new good is again, another opportunity for circularity that would fall under material usage. When we think of new business models, this is more trying to adjust our understanding of, of ownership of physical goods and potentially transition some of that ownership to a service that you pay for, but you don't actually earn, like own the physical product. So I think this one common one is where we think about cars and we look into the future, all of our vehicles, if we no longer individually own a car, but we all rent cars and use a service that allows us to access a car whenever we need that car, but we're not actually owning the, the good itself. In many cases, cars sit vac or sit idle for most of their life, and they're only used for a small percentage of, uh, of their lifetime in your ownership. So if there's an opportunity to change that business model from ownership to service, uh, that's a great example of where circularity can make a big impact on global emissions. In addition, when we're just designing these, these goods and products that people do own and purchase is that there are opportunities to make them longer lasting so that you're using it for more if it's lifetime, you're contributing to reduced overconsumption. And as a result, as the demand reduces, the, the production of these products should reduce. And then lastly, when we look at regeneration of nature, this is thinking of current processes that might be destructive for the earth, be pulling out nutrients from earth. So for example, if we're thinking of agricultural methods that are currently more destructive and replacing those with opportunities where you're actually returning biological materials back into the ground and contributing and promoting biodiversity, that is another huge area where, where circularity could come into play. But this is, again, big picture. We want to also address that the asterisks next to could and why Working in the circularity space can be challenging when you're trying to really quantify the environmental impact with a certain level of exactness and accuracy. So as I mentioned with this figure, this, these are estimates of how you could reduce your emissions. This is not exact, this is based off of a model. And in many cases, when you think of the impact that reuse can have or circular practices can have on the environment, a lot of the science that's needed to back up this environmental impact and quantify it is often based off of estimates. We just don't have the methodologies and the practices and the data in place to date where it's at the level that we really need it to be. And there's been, you know, there's a ton of effort and movement in the space. It's not at all like people don't acknowledge that there, these challenges exist, but a lot of companies are still really working to get all of the SKU level life cycle assessment data available for their products. So then that could be accounted for when we're looking at some of these, these emissions reductions. All that to say that when we're looking at the work that we do at Reapley and how we engage with our customers, a lot of our focus is how do we build in these long-standing circular practices where they're adjusting their standard operating procedures in a company so that they depend on reuse and they build in reuse into everything that they do. And in many ways, we, we know that there is an environmental impact and we can estimate that environmental impact. But as these methodologies are developing and becoming more robust, we know that our customers are putting into place these strategies so that when the methodologies are at the extent that we really need them to be, they will be able to really accurately estimate the or accurately quantify the impact of their efforts. So that's really a big push for us right now is getting to that, that change management piece and changing the way that a company runs their certain processes where reuse could really come into play and, and make a huge impact. So with that, we'll, we'll take another pause, open your web browser again, put in Menti one more time. And this is just based off of 
some of the information we shared on some previous slides when you think about the impact circularity can have in your line of work specifically. We're just we're curious to hear what your thoughts are. And sorry, but there is no all of the above because we want you to choose one that is the most impactful. <laughs> Although we know that there's probably all of these your business touches. Okay, yeah, I would say, I feel like I'm not that surprised to see that a lot of companies or a lot of attendees didn't do um, regeneration of nature. I feel like yeah. that is often the least when you're thinking of a direct companies and, and their impact within circularity. Okay, material usage, new business models, nice. And if anyone wants to also just throw in the chat, like any details on that, what kind of work you're doing, Welcome to do that. It'd be great to just hear what work you're doing. But okay, well then impact all across all of them. Amazing. I think we'll shift to the next slide. I don't see any more results popping in, but thank you for that. That's our last poll for today's session, but we appreciate the feedback. It really helps us to get a feel for who's on the line, where, how do you think about circularity? How does it happen to your day-to-day -day work? Um, but now zoning in a little more into reuse because that is of course the real the real space that Reaply is the most interested in and focuses the most on. When we think about where reuse can come into play with an organization's emissions, that is where we're looking at three different areas. So one is recirculation of products. One is reducing of waste, and the last is lower carbon materials. And we've touched on these in other slides in various different ways, but just want to just reiterate the, the direct relationship for reuse and, and reduction of emissions. So we're thinking of recirculating the product, as Daniel mentioned, with his pen, and he uses the pen, then I uses it, then he uses it again. And thinking of a company, and when they purchase all these pens for the company, there's opportunities, of course, to reduce the volume of goods that they purchase and any associated emissions from the production of those goods, the transportation of those goods. In addition, if they're just purchasing less chairs, say within one year period where they purchased 100 chairs and the next year they only need to purchase 50 chairs because they reused half of them. In that case, they are reducing any emissions that would be associated with putting those chairs in a landfill, having those chairs sent to another disposal method, the emissions associated with processing that waste, that waste breaking down over many years is where reuse can really have an impact as well. And then lastly, we've spoken a lot about construction industry and any of like the building materials. Those are often very high carbon impact products. They have large um, carbon emissions factors. And if you can, one, find opportunities, of course, to find alternatives for those products, but in addition, use reused materials in the, the building of a structure. And that's a huge opportunity to hit that embodied carbon that we discussed earlier. So in many cases, trying to really promote deconstruction versus demolition so that you can pull on these reusable materials that are still in very good shape and, and quality and can put them back into a new structure. And lastly, we're just gonna wrap up with the connection point to scope three. So we've talked about it several times. We showed you um, an example of a company that's reporting across all these categories. We wanted to share just in one slide, all of the 15 categories that fall within scope three, as well as sharing what is considered upstream ca uh, categories, as well as downstream categories for, for scope three emissions. And any of the text that you see boxed out on the slide is relating to where reuse fits in and where reuse can have an impact in a company's scope three emissions. So we'll start off at the top, just breaking them down. We have purchased goods and services, capital goods, waste generated in operations. And then if we move to the downstream side, we're looking at end of life treatment of sold products. 
for purchased goods and services, mentioned this previously, but this is looking at anything that a company buys either to produce their products. So this could be any materials or components that they purchase that then goes into the products that they create, as well as non-production related goods. And that can be the furniture that they purchase for their offices, the technology equipment that they need to support their employees. And when we think of Reaply and we think of where we connect with a lot of the companies that we work with, in many cases, it is more in that space of non-production goods. So it is often with the furniture, the equipment, the fixtures, all the things that a company will fill a building with is really what is important to us and what we can facilitate reuse through the Reaply platform. When we think of impact on scope three emissions, and any emissions associated with category one, you can look at this impact often over a period of time. So if a company is reporting their scope of three emissions for category one, and they're year over year for five years straight, they're telling you how much emissions come from their purchased goods and services. If say midway through those five years, they start to implement a reuse program by using, for example, the Reaply platform, they could see a reduction in their emissions as they reach that five-year point. So you'll see over time, as they start implementing reuse strategies, their purchase goods and services reduced because they stopped buying as many, the, the volume of goods that they purchased went down and therefore emissions associated with those purchases went down. So that's one key example, but in many cases, we like to emphasize the importance of looking at that impact over time. And as a company grows and they have more employees or more operations or more facilities, of course, that impacts their purchase goods and services that as well needs to be accounted for. Um, but similarly, if we're looking at category two, capital goods, this is really similar to purchase goods and services with respect to reuse and how it connects into them. Um, as well as how just a company reports these emissions. But this is looking at big ticket items, big ticket purchases like uh, vehicles, buildings, facilities, just a lot more expensive than the, the types of goods that would fall into category one. And then if we shift down to, to category five and talk about waste generating operations, you can think of this as any waste that the company generates that can either go to landfill, it can go to waste to energy, which is the same as incineration with energy recovery, it can go to composting or recycling, and this also accounts for wastewater. That is definitely not the space where we are in, but just wanted to share that if a company is like trying to report their category five emissions, they're also thinking of emissions associated with processing wastewater. But for us, we're all focused on solid waste to physical goods. Um, so with that respect, if we think of reuse and we think of where that comes into play, if a company is finding opportunities to continue to reuse the furniture and equipment in their buildings, there is, a, in that respect, would likely see a reduction in the waste that they produce year over year, and uh, therefore, that's where, where reuse could come into play with the emissions that are associated with that waste. And then the last section, speaking about end of life treatment of sold products, we've touched on this several times, but specifically with the lens of reuse and how reuse comes into play, if a company produces high-end shoes and they sell those to consumers, a consumer uses that shoe and rather than sending it to a landfill, they decide to send it back to the company because the company has implemented a take back program. That is an example of where reuse could come into play. With that respect, now a company has control over how their sold product is treated at the end of the life. They might break down that product in some extent, use some components of that product, build it into new products of theirs, and therefore have an impact on the emissions associated with the end of life of their products. So that's another example, but I'd say when we think of really how we engage with customers and like a large impact that we have with our customers, it's more tapping into category one, potentially category two, um, but more category one and category five. So we, we hope that helps with breaking down all scope three. If there's any questions, we're happy to, to answer those later. 
But with that, I'm just going to pass it over to Daniel to wrap us up. Great. So, yeah, so in, in summary, and this is a theme that probably has been clear throughout this entire presentation, um, but our, our, our perspective here at Reapley is that uh, reuse should really be the, the tip of the spear for climate action. Um, both in the buildings industry where we're doing quite a bit of work, uh, but also beyond that as well uh, into, in, into every, every company. Um, and, it, you know, and I think what we've shown today is the uh, uh, connections, how some of that connects to uh, how companies are thinking about carbon, how companies are talking about carbon, uh, how companies are reporting on carbon. Um, and and we, we just want to emphasize that uh, Reaply is here as a company, as a resource, as a technology platform uh, to, to, to really help uh, you all get started, no matter where you are uh, in the industry or, or where you are uh, in your journey uh, on climate action. So, um, so, so definitely uh, use us as a, as a resource and, and as a conduit to, to getting things going. Uh, on that topic of resources, we do have uh, a handful that will be uh, sharing uh, as well as a follow-up to this uh, listed in very, very fine print on this slide, but we'll make sure that these uh, links are available. Um, just some really great reading, some good best practices, some good areas for uh, for future learning uh, as well. So um, you know if you're if you're new to this work, if you're new to this uh, uh, this community of uh, climate climate actors, climate champions, um, there's a there's a lot of stuff out there to help you get started. Um, and if you've been in this community for for a while, uh, a lot of great venues to to continue your education uh, and to and to build this this community of uh, folks doing great work in the space. All right, we'll pass it back to Barney. Yeah, I think there's a uh, quite a lot of people from all different aspects, uh, from private, public, even research sector. So quite a few questions. So we'll try to get through as many as possible. The the one, I think the one of the first ones that came through is would would you all agree that the biggest buckets for carbon impact would be found upstream? And so is that where companies should technically start when it comes to addressing some of their scope three emissions? Or does it vary depending on the type of company? You know that may vary a little bit depending on the type of company, but I think uh, I, I think yes, like largely it's it, it's probably yeah. I would say it might be appropriate to say that that there are some pretty significant opportunities to create impact on that upstream side of things yeah. for sure. Um, you know, there's a there there's other. I mean, there there's companies out there like um, we uh, we were working or, or talking to a manufactured homes producer uh, and and learning about uh, their approach to to carbon accounting and uh, in in that situation, if we think about the the emissions associated with their product, it's it's an entire house um, and yeah, and the life cycle of that entire house and all the energy that it yep. produces. So, uh, you know, there are there are areas where like those downstream emissions associated with your product yeah. are going to be really, really huge. But, um, but I think like in terms of, of, you know, addressable opportunities that might be found the upstream. Yeah. Awesome. I think we have one question around, you know, what, what barriers maybe keep companies from rapidly reducing their scope three emissions? Is it culture, vendor relationships, technical abilities, um, various macroeconomic climates, maybe regionally or just generally that that could be impacting? So that one came through. Yeah, yeah. I would say a big piece that you mentioned, Barney, vendor relationships. I do think that is a huge area where that there's a lot of challenges around the control that a company has. Once a company has a certain process in place for the vendors that they tap into, uh, the type of uh, materials that they source for their products, deciding to almost entirely disrupt your process to some extent, depending on the impact that needs to be made, and identifying new vendors or forcing your existing vendors and suppliers to uh, 
start to pick up new practices and unless and saying that you know if you do not pick up these new practices and these methods then I am not doing business with you anymore these are I found to see is these are really really challenging conversations to have and it does very much impact the company itself when they want to ensure that they're still providing the same level of quality products to their their buyers their the other businesses or consumers that are using their products and they don't want to disrupt the the product itself that they're selling, but they want to disrupt the process at which they're producing that product and sourcing the materials for that product and ensuring that the end of life use of that product is better than it was prior. So I think finding that balance between maintaining your current business while disrupting it, <laughs> um, it, it contradicts each other, but it it is what a lot of companies I, I see struggle the most when it comes to really making an impact and feeling like it is just this overwhelming amount of change that you need to to build in that um, that takes a good amount of effort and time. Yeah, awesome. And then I think um, Daniel, maybe this this can go to you because I know you've had some experience with data center operators in that industry. But there was just a very general question around how carbon reporting in general by services inter- industries like data center operators are at currently and what what that could potentially look like in the future yeah um i i think as i as i had said previously um you know some some companies are definitely more more advanced in their in their journey than than others um you know i think like that's a space also where uh scope two emissions have been very very well prioritized so a lot of uh, effort going into uh you know energy efficiency reducing the cooling requirements bringing in new technology uh to to work with that um and you know and then maybe scope threes with the exception of, of a couple of companies of course uh scope three accounting maybe lagging a little a little behind that um but uh but yeah it's I, I would say like like everything that we've talked about today, there's you know front runners and those that are more like absolutely. I think um there's been a lot of questions general generally around um CO2 reductions through reuse for certain categories and products. So maybe both of you or one of you can talk just about how we're tackling that from an estimated embodied carbon reporting perspective and how that could be utilized by by companies to to start at least dipping their toes into reuse as a way to find mechanisms to track CO2 reduction. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to start. Um, I think when we talked about where reuse connects in with scope three emissions, specifically in, in reducing emissions, and we highlighted areas like purchased goods and services, when it comes to actually reporting that out with their emissions, there are standards and frameworks that a company uses to report their emissions. They account to how much emissions are associated with their purchased goods and services. I think a space where Reaply is really trying to support our customers is, okay, you've reported your emissions associated with purchased goods and services. Are there opportunities for us to also share potentially in a sustainability report, in other disclosures, the emissions that are avoided by you reusing these purchased goods that you already had in your company. So this is not something that would be included within any data for a company's uh, greenhouse gas reporting. It's separately reported from that data, but it can be included alongside your purchased goods and services data, for example. So you can say, this is our emissions for this year. We've implemented a reuse program by engaging with other companies such as Reaply, by posting our products on the Reaply platform or the goods that we use for our company on the Reaply platform. As a result of us internally recirculating these goods in our company over the past year, we found that we've avoided X amount of CO2, X kilograms of CO2 emissions equivalent through reuse. So it is something that you can you can publicly speak to and share the impact. But as mentioned previously, a lot of the data and methodologies around quantifying this impact are still developing. 
And so these are all still estimates, but as long as you're very clearly communicating what assumptions went into play when you're calculating those emissions reductions or those avoided emissions, I should say, um, then, then I think it's, it's a great opportunity for a company to publicly speak to this work. And that is something that we support our customers with through um, a carbon report that, uh, that speaks to that avoided emissions for embodied carbon. Cool. I think we are at time. Oh, so if yeah, you have yeah. any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat or you can find one of us and we can respond back. But I'll kick it back to, to Daniel and Valentina. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think I just wanted to wrap up by saying that this is recorded. You'll receive a recording after this session. This will also be posted on our website. So if you want to reference it in the future, you can find it on our website. And this will definitely, this is the first of one of these sessions. It won't be the last. We're going to try to incorporate new concepts and topics that are of interest to, to the public and, and continue these sessions going forward. Um, so thank you so much for joining. Any last questions? No, just thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for joining. Uh, thank you, Valentina. Uh, thank you, Barney. Thank you to the Reaply Media team for, for putting this together. Uh, and we hope to, to be in touch soon.